Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford. He is my partner in crime, Weston Hodkowitz. We're coming to you from different locations at Lambeau Field. And Wes, speaking of different locations, you are in a brand new spot, my friend. Tell me uh, tell me what sent you from whence you are now coming. Uh, well, Duke Bobber is the one that sent me from whence I am now coming. Uh, I, when you when you use your boss's office too much, eventually he just kicks you out. So I think actually the format of the show now f- moving forward should be I just end up in random parts of the building uh, for Packers Unscripted. Okay. Today we are coming to you live from the fifth floor suites or the hallways right outside of it. And I'll be honest with you, Mike, this is pretty nice. It's my first time, seven years as a Green Bay Packers employee, my first time ever being on the fifth floor. And uh, huh. yeah, I could get used to this. Okay. I like the, I like the, it's not it's nice, nice new look. I like the background <laughs> looks sharp. Well, depth of we feel, are... I think is what Tyler Gajewski calls it. Depth okay. of feel. Okay. Well, that would, yes, that would be Tyler, <laughs> Tyler, our meticulous <laughs> photographer in our, in our, uh, video department. Well, we're here to talk about the happenings of this past weekend at Lambeau Field. And specifically, I'm talking about the annual rookie mini camp, the uh, introduction of the draft class, the undrafted rookies, also several tryout players uh, who were taking a crack at making the 90 man offseason roster. And we'll talk about that a little more later on in the show as well. But rookie mini camp has come and gone now for 2023. And uh, what uh, what were your impressions, Wes? What what sticks with you as uh, as now the next time we're going to see these players on the field will be during OTAs. Got our first look at them this past weekend. Yeah, as always, Mike, I mean, you take the rookie minicamp with a grain of salt because one, these guys are just trying to understand the process here in Green Bay. They're trying to teach them how to practice, what the expectations are. And two, it's really our first time getting in front of these players in the locker room. So those are always the biggest two takeaways from this weekend. But I'll be honest with you. In my now 10 years, 12 years covering rookie mini camps, I don't know if I've ever seen anybody more physically impressive than Lucas Van Ness. Uh, he, it, it's one thing when you and I are sitting here writing these bulletin reports and during the draft and doing the stories and asking the questions afterwards. It's one thing to look at six foot five, 272 pounds, 81 inch uh, wingspan, 17 size shoe, as he told us in the locker room on Friday. But when you actually see him out on the field and even you look at some of Evan Siegel's photos, Lucas Van Ness for a 21 year old man is a pretty impressive physical specimen. And as important and as, as deep as this draft I feel was for green Bay in terms of finding the guy that getting off the bus is going to strike fear into opponents. I think the Packers hit the target with Lucas Van Ness. Yeah, it is interesting how, uh, cause we spend so much time both pre-draft during the draft, the, you know, the heights and weights and all the measurables and, and, you know, the numbers are just the numbers, right. And then suddenly you see, you see these, uh, these young men in person and it's like, oh, the numbers, the numbers actually mean something. They, they represent something and, and they do make a physical impression on you. I was I was also impressed, not not in the same way in terms of just overall stature, but in watching uh, the two tight ends, Luke Musgrave and and uh, Tucker Craft. Now, granted, this is just you know running around in in shorts and helmets, you know, no no pads or anything like that. But you can see why the Packers are so high on the athleticism of these tight ends and the potential different dimension that uh, that they could bring to the offense. Obviously, there's uh, there's a long way to go in terms of them, you know, learning the playbook and and, you know, the coaches figuring out exactly what their roles are going to be and 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 what they do best. Um, but when you see a couple of tight ends that are six, five, six, six and look like, you know, they're maybe a half step slower than the wide receivers, so to speak, you know, not, not that much difference in terms of that off the, off the line of scrimmage speed and, and breaking into routes and, and whatnot. It does, uh, it does make an impression on you and it'll just, it'll be interesting just to watch these players develop now through OTAs and then into training camp and put the pads on for the first time. Um, it's a, I, I don't care whether you're Tucker Kraft coming from South Dakota state or whether you're Lucas Van Ness coming from, you know, Iowa in the big 10 to the NFL. It's a, 
it's a big it's a big step physically and mentally and uh, and quite frankly these young men don't have a whole lot of time especially if you're going to be counted on to play and contribute early they don't have a whole lot of time to to get ready for it and prepare for it but uh, um you know but they're going to be asked to uh, they're going to be asked to do everything they can to be ready for week 1 yeah, especially, you know, if, if Mercedes Lewis isn't back, you have two guys at six foot five, six foot six in that ballpark of 255 pounds that are the, I don't want to say only in line traditional tight ends on the roster, but Josiah DeGuara, obviously more of that Swiss Army knife, that H back type of role. Tyler Davis is still, you know, has the frame to be a, a really solid tight end, but, you know, was a former college quarterback, had, had to make that transition to tight end Luke Musgrave and, and Tucker Kraft. I mean, these guys have been tight ends since birth, basically. I mean, when you look at the way they're built and then the we, the way in which they can accelerate, I forget who was saying this to me after the, the rookie mini camp got done, I believe on Saturday, um, looking at them running just some of those routes on air. And there was a, period where they're you know it's the quarterbacks and then some of the assistant coaches are throwing passes they're doing like five wide type sets and both Kraft and Musgrave took passes underneath and the way in which they not only caught the ball in rhythm but then accelerated upfield again there's no pads there's no defense you always want to add these caveats but yeah you can just tell that these guys are different type of athletes and in that same vein you know Jaden Reed I, I thought very much came as advertised uh the conversation i had with larry mccarran about this was he's just a smooth smooth football player he gets in and out of his breaks and and it's one thing to be successful when you're cutting and you're you're doing change of direction stuff but when you can do it with fluidity i think that's where you see these tyreek hills of the world sort of separate themselves and in that regard I think Jaden Reed has a lot of intangibles that you look for in this next generation of receivers. So as far as those first two days of the NFL draft were concerned, uh, I felt like watching those four players perform on Friday and Saturday, they are what they are supposed to be from an athletic standpoint. Yeah, I would totally agree. We, we also get our first chance, obviously, to, to meet these players, to talk to them, you know, try to try to get a sense of their personalities and whatnot a little bit. And um, uh, over the next, you know, week and a half, two weeks, Wes and I'll have uh, some, some follow-up stories on, on these draft picks um, based on some of those interviews and, and other things that we could dig into. But in terms of those impressions, I just, I have to say, I have to give Penn State quarterback, Sean Clifford, a heck of a lot of credit because the media, you know, the media comes in for the open locker room session to do interviews. And what's immediately noticed by everybody, of course, is that Sean Clifford is sitting in Aaron Rodgers' old locker. And, you know, it's it's his nameplate up there, Clifford number eight. Um, but it's where Rodgers has been forever, right? And as the media in waves, you know, come up to Clifford to uh, to to talk to him, he's, you know, asked by, you know, what, maybe at least a dozen different yeah. reporters. Hey, did you know that this is Aaron Rodgers? It's like, yeah, yeah, I think somebody informed me of that <laughs> along the way. And he I mean, to his credit, he, uh, you know, he even made a joke about it that that, you know, he was he came to Green Bay on a pre-draft visit and saw in the locker room where Aaron Rodgers locker was. And then now when he comes back as a draft pick like that was his locker, I, I'd imagine that that is something that that feels a little overwhelming. But to Clifford's credit, you know, all he's you know, all he talked about, all he's focused on is to is to learn the playbook, to get the offense down, to to uh, um, to play whatever role the the coaches need him yep. to play relative to Jordan Love while also competing, you know, with Danny Etling for the backup quarterback spot. And that, and that competition will really get going, uh, you know, a little bit in OTAs, but even in a more full fledged sense in, you know, training camp in the preseason games. But the first impression of Sean Clifford is this is, this feels like a very grounded young man who has, has uh, quite the head on his shoulders. And, uh, and you can just tell he's, he's an experienced guy, you know, 40 plus starts at Penn yeah. state, 30 plus victories as a starting, as a starting quarterback in the big 10. And uh, um, I think he's going to be an interesting guy to get to know as, uh, as his rookie season goes along. Well, 
And I, I think the same thing of like a Stetson Bennett, right? Like these guys that have played in big moments and in, in football hungry cities in college campuses, they come in as day three picks, but in reality, they kind of have a day one mindset in terms of how they approach the job. Uh, when you look at Clifford's situation, again, a kid that beat out Will Levis for Penn State's job, he, he rotated with him the first year there, and then ultimately Levis decided to transfer and then was the man for the next, what, two and a half years. Uh, yeah. So the, the other thing, too, that I think people have to understand, like, well, why would they give away Aaron Rodgers' locker? With the 13-player draft class, this isn't like the Mike McCarthy era 10 years ago where seventh-round picks were just kind of thrown into the, the green mile with all the other undrafted guys. The Packers give lockers to all their draft picks in the main area. In the, main, if you don't in the make, main locker room, yeah. If you don't make the team, then they'll transition you back to the practice squad area, the green mile. So with a 13-player draft class and as many returning players as they have, I think there's like maybe three lockers in the entire main area right now that aren't spoken for. Uh, and one of them is directly next to Jordan Love. And if you know anything about the way that we do press conferences here in Green Bay, you absolutely do not want to have a locker immediately <laughs> directly next to the starting quarterback. So you need to have some room there for that individual. But but all that being said, I thought Clifford took it in stride. And to be honest with you, when you're talking about this, I had a, I had a conversation with Sarah Quick, our assistant director of PR on Saturday after Grant Dubois got done. And I a really interesting conversation between my among myself and Grant and Jason Wilde and Cassidy Hill. And I said, I was like, man, I've just, I've been blown away by, you know, Grant and a lot of these prospects. And Sarah even mentioned, she's like, yeah, I think all the, all the guys were really good last weekend. And I, I have to agree. I mean, I thought if I didn't get to everybody, but watching between watching the videos and participating in these interviews, uh, I, I just, I mean, you could see why these players jumped off the page to Green Bay, regardless of whether it's a Lucas Van Ness or a kid, you know, like Carrington, uh, Carrington Valentine uh, from Kentucky, 21 years old in the seventh round. You can just sense that fire with them and just that professionalism and the idea that I, hey, I'm striving for something more here in Green Bay. And for that reason, I think once training camp comes around in July, this is going to be a very exciting year uh, to be covering the Green Bay Packers. Yeah, we'll do keep an eye out uh, uh, over the next couple of weeks. Wes and I will have uh, follow-up stories based on some of the, those interviews over rookie minicamp weekend on the draft picks. Um, some interesting stories uh, to be told there. Um, and another story and interview I want to get to in a moment, Wes, but I will take care of some sponsor business. Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 24-7 365 and at cousin subs we have something for everyone like our wisconsin cheese curds mac and cheese golden fries and creamy shakes all paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl cousin subs 50 years of better <laughs> all right um a story that you uh wes have already posted on our website earlier this week the Packers were allocated a player for the first time in what the nfl calls the international pathway program and it's a young man named kenneth Odomegu from nigeria um has a very interesting story and you've already written about it. it's on our site for anybody who wants to check it out i will just say six foot six 259 pounds he is quite the athlete you meant used to use the phrase physical specimen earlier he certainly falls into that category but this is you talk about literally learning the game of football from scratch and trying to go from being being an athlete and a very impressive looking one to all the way to becoming an NFL player as an adult uh you know as as a young man um this is going to be a very interesting story here and uh and he certainly has an interesting story to tell yeah he definitely does mike and it's funny to me too you mentioned the physical specimen well much like lucas van ness who has the nickname hercules Kenneth Udumagu, he actually also has the nickname Hercules. So th those two are going to have to kind of banter and, and battle over this thing, but <laughs> you can see why. I mean, the, the most impressive thing about him, in addition to just the, you know, I, it was such a fun interaction he had with the media and just kind of telling a little bit of his story and where he comes from. When Udumagu actually said a, a year ago, I didn't even know what a line of scrimmage is to today, I mean, now being in a, a position and he is grateful for it to to learn the game at the highest level. 
uh, from some of the best coaches and practitioners of the sport uh, is going to be very exciting for him. For as much as he didn't know, though, I really give him a lot of credit for the amount of time he spent really diving into the sport. Uh, first and foremost, OCU Manura, you look at the International Pathway Program, everything they've done out in London to, to try to it, grow the game internationally, but also give people opportunities that maybe not otherwise would have had them to, to play this sport. Odemegu is a perfect example of that because this is a kid that grew up in Nigeria playing soccer. He outgrew the sport. I mean, you don't see a lot of six foot six, 260 pound, you know, soccer players, midfielders Perfect. out on the field. He transitioned to basketball and ultimately working through educational basketball program out in Nigeria. They felt like, hey, his best spot potentially could be football. Omen Yura looked at him, said, hey, you're a defensive end, brought him into his camp, at the NFL Africa camp in Ghana. He won the defensive MVP award there. As he said, he still has yet to actually play an organized football game. All of this has been training and combines and all those things, but he's been staying up, you know, since coming to the United States in January, in addition to his physical training, he's been doing, he's been reading about this sport. He's been watching videos on YouTube, which is something Omen Yura kind of suggested to him to do. And he talked about the decision that he made with his parents deciding to try to make a run at the sport. And there was a really good quote in there that I tweeted it afterwards. That was one of my favorite bits. Just one little simple line where he said, there was something inside of me, something inside my heart that made me feel like this is possible. And here he is chasing the dream. He already had a chance to meet Rashawn Gary. He'll be working in that outside linebacker room with Preston Smith and Jason Rebrovich and a neat moment too on Saturday, you know, he's going out there, he's stretching and Matt LaFleur who actually wasn't here on Friday because he was down in Madison for gray guards, uh, cancer, uh, fun, uh, charity, you know, fundraiser, just a little bit of a, a, a fist step from, from Matt LaFleur to Odomagu at the beginning of practice. And it's just like, those are the little moments that, you know, to the onlookers, you might not quite understand what that means, but for a kid like this, that has basically dedicated his life to the past year towards being one of these eight players that did get allocated to an NFL team eternally grateful for. And as he said, he wants to be a pioneer for the sport. He wants to not only try to excel in this and learn how to play it in the NFL level, but also bring it back to his home country and give kids the same opportunity he's been afforded now in green Bay. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a story that, uh, that starts out as, you know, the longest of long shots, right? So it'll be really interesting to, to well, see how this unfolds and, and the Packers will, as an international pathway program player, he essentially is, is guaranteed a spot on the 90 man off season roster all the way through training camp. And then, um, if he doesn't make the 53 man roster, which is the most likely scenario, there is a practice squad exemption uh, for him to be able to stick around. So the Packers, uh, if they want to keep him on the practice squad, he's he becomes the 17th practice squad player, and you still have your normal allocation of of 16 uh, in, players in, in, in that regard. Go ahead. Yeah, and if I may too, Mike, when you're talking about the longest of long shots, I want to make this point because it's not like, oh, they just found Odomegu, and it's like, yep, you're going to come to the NFL. There was a pretty long process yes. for him to make it. The camp in Ghana, him going to the, the combine, 38 players were invited to the combine in London, which was, I think, five days before at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, five days before the Packers played the Giants. From that, only eight players were selected to be allocated. It's two NFL divisions. I believe it was the NFC North. And I want to say it was the AFC West was the other one. Those are the only two divisions this year that have this allocation process. It's not like, okay, well, they had 38 players and they just pushed them all around the league. Only eight guys got to do this. So it tells yeah. you exactly how high both OC Omanura is on this, but also the NFL to give him this opportunity. Yeah. And the Packers have already uh, switched him, so to speak. He was in the original announcement, he was announced as a defensive lineman at 6'6, 259. The Packers have decided to, uh, uh, to, uh, try to craft him, mold him as an outside linebacker in, you know, with that, uh, that Preston Smith sort of um, size and frame. And, uh, and Hey, if OC Umanura can do something for the Packers, aside from break the fans hearts in those, some of those uh, this is playoff the losses previously. Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, something, uh, something good will come out of that. I kid, of course, OC Umanura is a Too tremendous, soon. tremendous ambassador for the NFL, even though, uh, he was the uh, the enemy to Packers fans on the wrong side of things in some of those post seasons. But um, we'll close on close on this one, Wes. As far as uh, the the news over the weekend from yep. rookie minicamp, 
um, there were 14 players who were invited to the Packers rookie mini camp on a tryout basis. And in that respect, they're, you know, essentially trying to earn a contract as an undrafted rookie, as an undrafted free agent onto that 90 man offseason roster. And the Packers ended up signing three tryout players, um, Broughton Hatcher, a long snapper from Old Dominion, William Hooper, a cornerback from Northwestern State and Antonio Moultrie, a defensive lineman from Alabama, Birmingham, UAB. And uh, on on the news side of things, other than obviously watching these players to see if, you know, who, who might be the next, you know, Lucas Patrick, the, you know, the tryout that player nobody had ever heard of who maybe ends up becoming a regular player in the NFL. But Hatcher, the long snapper from Old Dominion, has replaced Jack Coco on yeah. the roster. And Hatcher is now the competition for Matt Orzich, the long snapper that the Packers signed, the veteran long snapper who was signed as a free agent, one of the Packers' few free agent acquisitions during the offseason. So um, as we talked about many times, Rich Bisaccia's, you know, stamp is is all over this uh, this Packers roster and, and everything with regard to special teams. And the Packers leaving no stone unturned in uh, in, in that regard here already, um, a, a change in terms of uh, the competition that will be setting up at long snapper as uh, the Packers move into the spring and summer. Yeah, and, and obviously for the Green Bay Packers, it continues that that cycle they've been going through with long snappers since making the decision to have Steed and Wardle replace Hunter Bradley midway through. I believe that was the 20 season. Uh, listen, uh, this is going to be a situation where, you know, you knew with Matt Orzik that he could be the guy. Um, not only because of the contract, not only because they signed him as an unrestricted free agent, the Packers had interest in him going back two years ago. It just so happened that the Rams, when they tried to claim, when the Packers tried to claim him, the Rams had a higher waiver claim and were able to get him. And then obviously went and won a Super Bowl there. So he is the incumbent now. I think you would say he is probably the favorite for it, but Hatcher, uh, he, there's a lot to like about him. When you look at the fact, I believe one, when I was reading his bio, he was like the fifth or sixth top recruited, top rated long snapper when he was coming out of high school, played 35 games for Old Dominion. Old Dominion s- says that he was never credited with a bad snap during that time, missed the 20 season because of COVID, missed all but one game in 21 because of an ankle injury. But, uh, you know, BR Hatcher is a kid that has been doing this at a high level for a number of years. Whereas Jack was making that transition, he was kind of a tweener between tight end and, and long snapper. Uh, Hatcher, this has been his preferred position going all the way back to high school. So uh, he'll be the one that comes in and, and pushes Orchik, Orzik, excuse me, for the job. And unfortunately for Jack, I felt terrible. I sent him a little message after uh, the news came out because I, I really did enjoy the kid. Uh, I have so much respect for what he did and being willing to really put everything he had into becoming a long snapper last year. I think it was a success. The fact that he went from being a tryout, being a guy that had hadn't been a long snapper on punts since high school, as far as in an in-game setting. And he put himself in a position to be a long snapper here for an entire season, all 17 games. My hat goes off to him. And, and obviously the green Bay Packers, as they begin these renovations on special teams and with the specialists, they have two new candidates here for the job in 2023. Yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see how that competition unfolds, uh, sir, especially when uh, when we get to training camp and the preseason games. Uh, you know, where you imagine, um, you know, both of those guys uh, getting uh, getting a chance to to snap in game action with their Packers uniform. So, uh, with that, we will call it a wrap on this edition of Packers Unscripted. Be sure to follow all of our coverage of the team on packers.com for Wes I am Mike thank you for tuning in everybody and we will see you next time